Major phone carriers make you sign contracts with rigid data plans to trap you into a kind of forced phonogamy. Sounds pretty insecure if you ask me. At Consumer Cellular, we believe in a more consensual and healthy form of phonogamy, free of contracts and more flexible to your data needs. This way, you stick around not because we force you to with contracts and fees, but because you love our phone plans. Like ardently love our phone plans. Phonogamously. Consumer Cellular. When Freedom calls, we're here to answer. Call us at 1-888-FREEDOM. Welcome to the Media Roundtable Special Edition. I'm your host, Dan Granger. This is where we talk about hot topics in service of the Chief Audio Officer. What is a Chief Audio Officer, you might ask? Obviously, you haven't downloaded our free white paper at OxfordRoad.com. Uh, but the Chief Audio Officer is the, the person who is responsible for the success of a brand within an audio program. Uh, whether it's radio, podcast, streaming, it's a unique type of uh, uh, media and it requires a lot of nuanced support if you're going to be successful as a brand advertising there. So we came up with this fancy term, uh, chief audio officer, uh, in hopes that it would provide as a shorthand for people that um, that need, know that it's hard, know that they want to be successful and they want to designate somebody within their organization who can really take ownership of that channel. Because what we find is that brands who designate a champion for the channel within their organization are far more likely to be successful, whatever their actual title is. Um, and so that's who we're here to serve. And as we continue to uh, refine our podcast here and a lot of the content that we create, that is who it is for. Um, if you're uh, new to this, uh, it's important that you know that we hosted an event um, on behalf of Oxford Road, but for the chief audio officers. We called it the Chief Audio Officer Summit. We had it in L.A., uh, in July of this summer, 2023, it was a smashing success. We had over 50 marketers across about 40 different brands come into town, and we had a number of keynote speeches and panels exploring this idea of what is audio advertising, how does it work in a nuanced way, and how can you be successful at it? What we're going to be doing is rebroadcasting some of those sessions, uh, and we're going to do that for the first time here today. And just to give you a little taste of what's coming, let's just listen to a quick clip from Kezia Koo, who is a senior marketer at Indeed, uh, who is very prolific in the audio space. Take a listen. My customers are consuming all types of audio. There just isn't a type of audio that doesn't work for us. Like, it all works for us. Fair enough, some types of audio took us longer to figure out to unlock. But in order for us to be at the scale we're at, we had to get that to work because the reality is our customers were there. They were responsive. And so it, we needed to be there. And so that's what I would say. So as you can hear, we brought together some of the leading minds from the top brands uh, who have really been successful in the space. Kesey is a great example of that. We had a panel called the Chief Audio Officer Buying Guide that was hosted by President of Oxford Road, Stephen Abraham, and also included May He from uh, Oracle and NetSuite. We had Eliza Davis, who's the director of growth from Babel. And we had Miranda Romano, who many of you have heard on this program before, who's the head of our media operations here at Oxford Road. So a lot of power players in the world of, of audio. And there's about, it's a give or take 30 minutes of, uh, of panel. And I think you're going to learn a lot from listening that, to that. But before we get into it, um, we're going to... Uh, Come back with the news. We, we've been doing these wonderful segments. We're going to try to go really fast for you today to cover the news of the last week. And we have with us um, some very special guests. We have uh, Spencer Siemens in his back. Welcome, Spencer. We have, we have Neil Lucy. Glad you're with us, Neil. Hello, hello. We have Stu Redwine, head of creative at Oxford Road. My pleasure. I thought you were using the, the power of silence for a second there. And then, of course, we have um, the man behind uh, a lot of the news that we're covering. Uh, we have the great James Cridlin is back, and he's reporting from an underground bunker uh, several continents away. Uh, wh what's going? Can you talk about where you're uh, reporting in from, James? What's going on? 
I, I am in an underground car park, yes. Uh, there are people who are um, replacing a fence next to my house, and there's lots of drilling, and there's lots of uh, of, of sawing wood, and there's lots of um, rock radio as well. So I decided I would use the uh, emergency studio, and that's where I am today. Well, I like the microphone that you have in your emergency studio. Can you um, share, since everybody has a podcast, can you share what, what we're working with that's made so it possible sure. for you to turn your car into a sound studio? Yes. Well, sure, I can. It's a Shaw MV88+, Plus, which is a little USB mic. Uh, it's a very cool little uh, mic, with it, which I think is supposed to be used for video recording, but it is absolutely perfect. Whenever I take uh, anything on the road, uh, this is the one. All right. Um, so look, we got a lot to cover. We don't have a lot of time to do it. So let's get started. Spencer, you have a a mystery story that we really don't know much about. Um, but I'd love for you to introduce, uh, the first hot topic that's trending in our world. Uh, can you tell us, uh, tell us what you have to, to share? You're always saying cardio isn't the right way to lose weight. I mean, why? The only thing I would say is if you like doing cardio, keep doing cardio. But what ultimately ends up happening, your body eventually stops responding to it. You need to stop doing steady state cardio because it's not a quality way of losing weight long term. And you're going to hate it. And those both work together. And that's basically a recipe for disaster. The answer, it's in your body and in your body type alone. Once you know what your body type is, the road to weight loss is so much easier because it fits your metabolic needs and your body isn't constantly fighting against you. This is our body type that's a free quiz. It's six different questions. How um, long does it take me? How long? Legit it? 20 seconds. You can do it. Seriously? Yeah, you can do it right now. And then at the end of it, it tells you what your body type is, but it also tells you the three most important things to do based on what your body type is. And it's completely free. Yeah, click the link if anybody's watching this want to figure out your body type, and I'll show you how to get in shape. The clip you just heard is from a fresh new podcast, is what I would say if it was in any way real, because that's right. People are making fake podcast videos for TikTok as advertisements for their various products and scams. It's a clear testament to the power of podcasts that hucksters, con men, scammers, and internet hustlers can find legitimacy just by pretending to be guests on one. Uh, we just heard from recent scam artist V Shred, a health and fitness influencer, pretending to be a guest on Joe Rogan by replicating his set, specifically the red curtain behind the guests. And many other examples have been documented and collected by internet sleuths in recent months. Uh, The worst faux pas I've seen is someone using the audio, but not from the mic that they're sitting right in front of. Um, As a media buyer, I'm always trying to find new talent, possible DR diamonds in the rough, if you will. And this weird trend is bananas, and it's making it extremely difficult for me to do my job and make sure my clients are positioned correctly in the market. And it's also delegitimizing the efficacy of YouTube shorts and TikTok added value for podcasts and YouTube buys, which truly grinds my gears. Um, And uh, in summation, just because someone sits in front of a mic and says something authoritarily, that doesn't mean there's actually anyone sitting on the other side. So be safe out there, CAOs and buyers alike. So it sounds like, I mean, it's a a great source of flattery, of course, that uh, there's so much imitation going on. But it sounds like it's not just that people are using images of themselves on a podcast interview that never really happened for credibility. It sounds like they're actually approaching marketers saying, here, give us sponsorship dollars for a program that doesn't even exist. Sponsorship dollars, um, speaking engagements. A lot of people have subscriptions to their hustle and grind services and their coaching skills when they're like 20 years old. And it really, it does, it's not very difficult to make these. They just literally will sit this way and talk this way to another person. And that's it. That's really all you got to do with, with one mic and a, and some headphones. You are a podcaster, but not really. And for anybody that's watching this on YouTube, is there any correlation whatsoever between that and Andy Rooney, who's sitting behind you? <laughs> no, but he had some very strong opinions, as do I, and I'm just the same curmudgeon. So there it is. Well, we like those strong opinions. So, James, um, is this new news? Are we uh, are we breaking news live here on the Media Roundtable podcast, or is this something that's already been out there? 
Uh, it was mentioned by the Buzzcast podcast, which is the Buzzsprout podcast, um, a couple of weeks ago. But yeah, lots of people uh, just pretending that they are on shows um, and and just sort of, you know, and, and uh, aren't I clever? I managed to get onto the Joe Rogan show. But the way that you spot them is there's no link to the podcast that they appeared on because of course they didn't uh so it's a it's a fascinating thing and i think you know uh, as you say incredibly flattering that people um are now seeing podcasting as being that important that they are now faking their appearances on them well i think we all feel a lot more important uh as a result of this so let's move on to other stories so some some other um uh, reporting coming out about the industry. A uh, new report from Dentsu uh, suggests that audio ads outperform video for attention and brand recall. And Stu's going to share a little context on this. I guess I want to preface by saying, you know, look, isn't it convenient for us to tell you that audio drives the best recall? I always take this stuff with a grain of salt, always consider the source. Stu, is this is this legit? Is the from what you can tell? Do you believe this to be true? I do. I absolutely do. I think um, you know there was an ad age article back uh, June sixth where VML Y and R, uh, their commerce and health department, is doing work in Puerto Rico helping with Alzheimer's treatment um, to help people with their memories using audio using jingles. And there are studies that we've linked even in the uh, the most recent white paper where the studies verify that um, that sound is processed in the same part of the brain that emotion is processed in. Um, it greatly aids in recall because it accesses different parts of our memory, right? We have explicit memory. We have um, long-term memory. We have procedural memory. Um, music kind of touches every type of memory that, um, we have because we actually sing along with it. We go along with it. And so we're, we're rehearsing and remembering it more. Um, and it's just incredibly powerful. It's also the fastest of our senses. It's something like visual. If you have a visual sim- stimuli, it's 180 to 200 and some milliseconds for you to respond for an auditory stimuli. It's 160 milliseconds or less. So it's just I, why, yes, you're saying, yeah, well, isn't this convenient? Um, doesn't make it any less true that audio is incredibly powerful. And it's good to see some studies that are out there beyond just our performance data um, or or other uh, academic studies that are verifying what we know to be true, which is audio is incredibly intimate and it's cr- incredibly powerful um, in creating memory structures and calling people to take action. So that's a strong vote of confidence from Stu. James, what are you thinking? I mean, you know, whenever you see research which uh, iHeartMedia has uh, paid for, you know it's always going to be good in terms of audio uh, and and good on that side. But having said that, this isn't research that says anything that we don't already know from tons of other research as well. So I think from that point of view, it's really helpful. Um, And, uh, you know, more of this stuff for the chief audio officers out there to prove that audio is a really important part of the media mix. That's a really important thing. I think the really important thing is that James Cridland just referred to chief audio officers. So this thing is picking up steam. We got an endorsement for the term from a leader at um, Paramount a couple of days ago. I think this is really I think this is taking the industry by storm. Uh, Neil. It, uh, are you are you a believer now? What do you think? Uh, I, I I believe in fundamentally. I believe in the research. I'd love to see uh, more details on the research. From what I've seen so far, it's the the press coverage of the research. I think there's a webinar coming up that where they will present the actual findings. I'd love to understand how they define video. Um, you know, to make sure that you're comparing apples to apples. Um, But fundamentally, we know that audio advertising works. Um, So I think there's a lot of truth in it. I just like to see some of the finer details on the research. I think we need to get some better case studies out showing actual performance data or brand recall data from in-market brands comparing audio versus video, because I think, you know, 
here's what we know anecdotally. When we have a podcast that is simulcasted on YouTube, the one plus one equals three. We'll usually see more than uh, just a like for like impact from those impressions. And so I'm always scratching my head going, all right, I know I love audio. I know all of the benefits with trust and intimacy and all that. You start talking about brand recall. You know, I remember from my career in radio, the executives were always talking about getting our fair share of the market pie. And, you know, I think if, if research like this continues to hold up and we can continue to validate it, I think it does underscore that this is an under monetized media asset uh, that is probably deserving of, uh, of more, of more dollars than it gets. Yeah. To, to your value of the simulcast, I think it, it bears repeating that there's about a 10 percentage point uh, difference in renewal rates for podcasts with simulcast versus podcasts that aren't simulcast. You're saying 10% more likely to get renewed. Yeah. For the ones that have video for the video simulcast. We should do a case study on this perhaps. That's good Intel. All right. Well, listen, I got, I got to keep us moving here. So let's talk about the next uh, story and we're going to go back to Spencer for this one. It sounds like there's a lot going on with Patreon. Um, best way I think about Patreon to understand it is that it's basically Substack for uh, podcasts. And it sounds like they have some news um, about a partnership with Spotify. So, um, Spencer, do you want to uh, add some some color to this one and, and your point of view? Yeah, it's really simple. Um Patreon, which was this previous holy grail that nobody could really touch, is now going to have Patreon-only podcasts on the Spotify app. So if you previously, as a consumer, could only listen to them on Patreon, you can now have them with all of your regular podcasts, RSS, on the Spotify app. And this is really interesting because you could really only get it in one place. It was multiple subscriptions. Now it's in one And it's very helpful for somebody who wants to have everything very convenient. When it comes to advertisers, it's still technically untouchable. But now it's actually in a spot where you could possibly touch it in the future. And this is a big deal because there are things that drive huge amounts of reach, but we don't know about the DR potential yet. So it might be something that's further down the line, but it's definitely something extremely interesting that I'll be looking at as somebody, too, who has a lot of advertisers already asking for this. James, I know you've got some thoughts on this one. Yeah, I I find this really interesting. There's loads of money which is paid to creators using uh, Patreon. Um, This uh, stuff isn't new for Spotify in that they've been offering this type of uh, paid subscription deal with a a supporting cast, with Supercast in the past. Um, You can also get paid Patreon uh, podcasts within Apple Podcasts and other um, podcast apps that support open RSS, which of course Spotify doesn't. But um, to be able to see Spotify now supporting Patreon as well uh, is uh, really good. And it's just, you know, another way of getting revenue, of getting income into creators, um, which doesn't rely on advertising money. And that's helpful for a large number of um, of uh, creators out there. So, you know, it, it, it's probably part that it's probably also also partially Spotify trying to rain on Apple's parade a little bit in terms of paid for subscriptions and stuff. Why spend, uh, you know, why lose thirty percent of your revenue uh, in uh, Apple when you can get this stuff for free with Patreon and with uh, Spotify? So perhaps it's that as well. So um, for a consumer, is this analogous to say HBO? Um, being distributed on through Apple TV, uh, but now you can also get it uh, through your your Fire Stick. Is it is it sort of like that? I mean, it's it's um, it's certainly there's certainly a UX play here. It's uh, certainly much easier now with this new integration that uh, Spotify has uh, brought out for you to be able to say, "I am a supporter." I, you know, I'm a, a, a supporter of um, of whatever it is on on Patreon. I can press one button, and that 
uh, paid for subscription is now available in my Spotify app. Um, that has never been available in the past. And I think that from a UX point of view is huge, given that Spotify is the largest podcast platform out there in terms of people, not maybe in terms of downloads. But that I think is a really huge thing. Yeah. Do you think it's likely that um, ad support is going to be next? I guess maybe, but I guess um, Patreon is really there as a um, as a creator uh, revenue source. So you ask people to be your patrons, podnews.net slash Patreon. Uh, you ask people to be your patrons and then they get and then they get um, uh, income out of that. So perhaps it's actually a, a way for people to circumvent advertising, but there's no reason why they both can't work hand in hand with that. You know, um, there are plenty of podcasters out there who are offering paid for su- subscription tools that also contain advertising in there as well. And perhaps that's um, where the future might be in terms of making sure that you cover all of your basis in terms of where you get your cash from it, it's not clear to me what the revenue play is for spotify because they they expressly say that the revenue stays with the the creator so uh i think on a long-term basis they will probably try to monetize this um but also it is a it is a way to grow audience and spotify has certainly grown their audience yeah, it does feel like there's some competition to just get more engagement, more users, not give anybody a reason to use any other platform. And same thing that they're doing with attribution, right? They're just now giving it away. And, okay, are they going to monetize that directly, indirectly, or is it simply good enough if it gets people to stay on the platform so they can sell them products you know, through other vehicles? I guess we won't know that for some time, but it does seem consistent. And it's interesting to see them continue to make plays to make themselves more appealing to a broader audience. And even with the wave of, you know, first we saw it with Trevor Noah. Now we see some upcoming contracts with talent where they used to gate it and only let you consume it through Spotify. Now they're opening it up across platforms. So, you know, they're obviously doing a lot of experimentation right now to try to keep people engaged and try to reach as many as they can by any means necessary, right? All right. So uh, next story, uh, podcasting has crossed another milestone. Sounds like uh, 10% of listening time is now spent with podcasts. I believe I read that um, when they started recording it in 2014, it was something like 1.6%. Uh, so it sounds like the share of ear is increasing greatly. Um, Neil, did you want to shed any light on this one? Uh, I would, there's a couple of things I'd say. One is if you uh, had had any wonder what the impact of COVID was on media and listening behavior, this is a pretty telltale, um, you know, reason to believe that it had a big impact. Because in 2020, podcast was 5% of listening time. 2023, it's 10% of listening time. That's a huge difference. Uh, streaming share of listening time has gone up as well. AM, ref, AM FM radio share is still strong, but it's decreasing. So it was 42% in 2020, and now it's 36%. I think, Dan, on our pre-prep, you, you, you mentioned radio as maybe like a slowly melting iceberg. Uh, so, well, I was actually quoting something I read in James's, uh, publication. I think you had interviewed, uh, (laughs) who's our friend, uh, over at, uh, yes, it was Rob uh, Ellen, um, from one who was, who was saying that radio, uh, that radio was a slowly melting ice cube, which I thought was, uh, was an absolutely correct uh, thing. It does kind of work because actually ice cubes take longer to to... iceberg instead of ice cube. (laughs) Yeah, <laughs> or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Um, no, I mean... Pick a frozen I, I, substance, it's melting. Yeah. Yeah, no, but I think also, you know, listening time is a hugely important stat. And I am, uh, for anybody that will li- listen, I will ask people, please stop talking about uh, podcasting reaching 45% of all Americans or 33% of all Americans or whatever the figure is, whether it's a weekly figure or whether it's a monthly figure, that is less and less important. And also, by the way, it's going to go up less and less fast. Instead, let's focus on listen time. Let's focus on the time spent with 
podcasting. That is where the money is. That is where the growth is going to be. Um, and I would much rather that we talked about time spent listening rather than total cum because total cum is relatively meaningless when actually what you want to do is you want to reach people enough times during their working week so that they can make a decision about buying something. So so the more data that comes out of this, and this is great figures from Edison Research, the more data that comes out of this, the better as far as I'm concerned. What's kind of interesting to me about this is I've been spending a little time trying to figure out, all right, what is audio capturing revenue-wise internationally and in the U.S.? And it, it, the best I can tell from the reports that are available, it looks like it's about a $36 billion industry, and about $18 billion of that is happening in the U.S. Now, if this is saying that 10% of that time is spent with podcasts specifically, isn't it interesting that we're just now bumping our head on $2 billion, uh, which is there about 10% of the uh, the total pie? So it does, it does make a lot of logical sense, um, and I think... Uh, You know, when you look at the trend line on podcasts specifically, we're we're talking about something that's gone from nothing to something in a relatively short period of time. But I think we can anticipate that that trend line is going to continue and and continue to pull share from the other slices. Um, Neil, uh, it sounds like you want to get into an argument with James. Um, So we'll make time for that. James, I I just want to say that the media planner in me, uh, still thinks reach is important. So, oh, it's uh, important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Time it's stone important. is certainly a factor <laughs> to consider, but I also want to reach as many people as I can through the channel that I'm advertising. Yeah, I think that wasn't a very good right. fight. I mean, guys. I think. I, I think both, but both of them are important. But I think that the headline figure, when we're talking about is podcasting still growing, the headline figure that we, we should be talking about in the future is time is time spent listening. And um, the one thing, uh, Dan, around um, international revenue is that actually international revenue. It's really interesting having a look at some of the data and actually seeing that. Um, Many of the international podcast markets are really underperforming in comparison to the US. So if you look at the amount of consumption that is going on at the moment and you look at the amount of revenue that they should be making if they were um, as advanced markets as the US is um, actually, you know, doing particularly, um, you know, badly. The UK, for example, is is really only earning about 20 percent of the money that it really should be in terms of podcast advertising. So um, I think there's an awful lot of growth to be done outside of the US as well. Yeah, I, I agreed. It, it is under monetized for sure. Um, and, you know, the topic I really want to discuss that I'm going to bookmark for the future is how much money is going towards subscriptions like Spotify and Pandora and Patreon that doesn't even get captured when we look at the advertising revenue reports that's totally new and incremental uh, that I think kind of covers up a lot of the real growth story behind audio. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so we'll, we'll, we'll dig into that in the future. Uh, so our closing topic here for our 15 minutes, which is approaching 25 is um, uh, <laughs> James, you've got a roundup of new financial reports based on Q2 performance from a lot of publishers. So, I would love for you to summarize that and, you know, what, tell us what stories it, it tells that should be interesting to marketers. Yeah, I mean, basically, the, the, the stories from all of the financial results that have come out is that podcast revenue is up and in many cases is up very high. Acast uh, is up by 22% quarter on quarter. iHeartMedia up 25% quarter on quarter. Uh, Sirius XM, uh, Salem Media Group all say that it's up. And to your point, Dan, around um, around uh, uh, subscription revenue, Podimo, which is a big Danish premium podcast company, they released their financial report for last year. And they show an incredible increase in terms of uh, revenue tripling uh, in terms of their subscription business. So I'm just sort of curious. We hear two stories in the press. One story is um, from all of these financial results. Oh, look, 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 look at all these um, all these uh, uh, figures going up. But then we're also hearing that the advertising market is getting softer and it's getting harder. So I'm just kind of wondering what's real. Is it real that 
all this money is going up or is it actually real that uh, advertising is getting softer or is it both? Well, one thing I want to clarify with you, James, is when you're talking about the numbers going up, are these podcast numbers within the total portfolio yeah. of assets? These are by these? specifically it's, podcast numbers. Yeah, yeah. And, that, yeah, and that's all because, that I really care about. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because, you know, if I if I ran a really big publicly traded media company that was invested in podcast and other channels like a big melting iceberg or ice cube, however you prefer it, I might want to really put a lot of resources behind showing my growth in podcast, even if the other one is sliding down, right? And so how much of it is shell game versus actual? I don't think we'll know that. I will say from our point of view, you know, we, we get to be an interesting bellwether because we get to see a composite of brands and their behavior in the market, right? And I see this year taking a similar shape financially, setting aside all other comparisons to 2020, where in the first quarter, there was a lot of sudden panic and a lot of people reacting. And when they're panicked and when there's fear, people tighten up, they don't spend as much. We all saw that, we felt that, and we've seen a lot of consequences from it. Now, in the second quarter, people started saying, okay, maybe it's not going to be as bad as we thought. Maybe it's going to be okay. And I actually see some budgets coming back. So I, I think that the the headline is probably accurate, is my my anecdotal perception, that it really is seeing some improvement over what we saw in Q1. I think the second half of the year is going to be a very different story than the first. Um, where people are starting to relax a little bit. And I still think even within that, you've got one publisher kind of burying the bad news about how the the total business is struggling by being able to really prop up a lot of these podcast assets. Because you can, you can shade the revenue any color you want if you can have some association with podcasts. And I'd imagine people want to use those types of levers for their reporting. Some... You buy it. <laughs> I, I I buy it. I, I mean, the, the Odyssey and iHeart they definitely mentioned in their financial results that terrestrial revenue, ad revenue, is down. So, podcasts, digital parts of the business are the bright spots that they want to focus on. For sure, for sure. And I think, in a lot of ways, that's been the story of the industry for the last probably five years, where it's like, don't look over here. Look at all these podcast headlines and, uh, you know, yeah, but, yeah. but it is growing and it's a true story. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think yeah. we can accept Odyssey's, the Odyssey is, of headline. course, being really interesting in the Odyssey. Uh, both had to jump out of a very large contract with uh, APM because it was uh, costing them too much. Um, but also they frankly said very little about their podcasting business this time around. And, and that's always a little bit suspicious when you get a old media transmission mission company like Odyssey, who are there very, very um, uh, carefully not saying very much about their podcasting is always a slight concern. All right. So tell me if you've ever heard of any of these companies. Indeed, Shopify, NetSuite, Headspace, Quip, Theragun, Postmates. You know, I'm not only the host of the Media Roundtable, but also CEO of a company called Oxford Road, and we are the world's leading independently owned and operated audio ad agency. And what that means is that we help great companies, many that you have probably heard of on some of the other podcasts that you listen to. We help them test and scale campaigns in audio channels with podcasts being one of those leading channels. Some of the work that we do includes media planning and buying, as well as analytics, attribution and insights. And we also have a very special way that we deal with uh, creative and copy generation. We have our own proprietary process called Audiolytics that allows us to score ads for their persuasiveness. If you're looking to be involved in audio and you want a partner that can help work with you to make sure that you achieve unprecedented ROI and massive scale, you should get in touch with us at Oxford Road. And by the way, the only reason that we're able to do the work of the Media Roundtable is because we have a great team at Oxford Road that supports us and makes it possible. 
So, you know, what we're doing is not just a podcast, but we're really trying to help brands live out their values and balance that with their business objectives, which is an increasingly hard thing to do in this world of misinformation and malice that's infecting so much of our media. But at Oxford Road, we don't want to just broker this stuff. We want to impact the industry for good. We want to raise the bar on what gets created. And Oxford Road is helping make that possible through the Media Roundtable. So if you're somebody that's interested in working with an ad agency or a partner on this type of work for your advertising campaigns, go to OxfordRoad.com. It's easy to spell. And get in touch with us or at least just sign up for our free newsletter, The Influencer. That's OxfordRoad.com. Yeah, well, they've had a busy year. Um, but I, I think we are seeing system wide uh, what what you're reporting is um, is something I think we're seeing is a lot more common. And we knew this was going to happen. Like we've been talking about this for a long time where people were signing irrational deals with talent. There was an arms race to get as many big names as you can under contract. And all these upfront guarantees are just they're choking on them now. And so I think. That's one of a lot of examples that are recent, and I think we'll probably continue to see some of those. But again, uh, it's been it's been more of a buyer's market um, as a result of it. There's more inventory available that needs to get monetized for something, and I think the brands have a lot of opportunity uh, in that type of environment. So any closing thoughts before uh, we all get kicked out of here? Perfect. All right. So I want to thank you. Stu, Spencer, Neil, and James. Uh, James, I'm really impressed with your backup studio. Um, most of <laughs> us just want to. St- you've got studios on studios, so good for you showing us how to how anyone with a vehicle can have theirs too. Uh, we're now going to transition into our special segment uh, from the Chief Audio Officer Summit in Los Angeles on the Chief Audio Officer's Buying Guide, and stay tuned for that. While we all strive to uh, to sort of pull in discussions around big data when we're making our decisions and even to the point where we've had some discussions about zero-party data today, at the end of the day, when rubber hits the road, um, we're kind of all beholden to, 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 to the dollar, right, and what that's going to perform uh, for us. And so when you bring it down to it, best-in-market media pricing is still – obviously very very key in our minds where, where there's a room full of full of individuals who manage you know multi-million dollar um, budgets on behalf of their companies and how we deploy those and how effectively we deploy them into the market is is critical and important so yes we've seen audio um, experience a boom um, a flurry of activity in the space in the past few years we've talked about it at length today um, and you know even with the points that we're seeing green shoots in the economy things are looking up but despite this you know there's still many marketeers who remain cautious about dealing with the channel the, the product needs to be seen digital channels require less risk wary of controversy that some hosts can elicit um, so for the last panel of the day we want to dive into the area more deeply and i'm delighted to introduce four uh very powerful business leaders i'm intimidated by this panel i have to say uh four great colleagues who i work with regularly and um I, you know we want to we want to talk to them a little bit about how their thoughts on on how they manage and and sort of deploy and control the dollars for their individual company so i'm delighted to uh, present um, all four of you, if you could maybe spend a few words, um, May, Kezia, Eliza, and obviously uh, Miranda from Oxford Road. So if you want to say a couple of words about yourselves. Sure. My name is May He, and I run um, Global Paid Media at Oracle, and uh, you know, excited to be here. It's definitely a space that I feel like a blink of an eye, we've been in this for a while. It felt like just yesterday we were tipping our toes into it. Hi. My name is Kezia Koo, and I'm from Indeed, and so I'm the Senior Director of Global Employer Marketing, and so in short, I help employers use us as their hiring partners. I've been in audio for at least 10 years at four different companies, and so it's a great space, and so you're going to hear a lot of great things from me. (laughs) Hi, I'm Miranda. Um, I've been at Oxford Road for 10 years. I oversee the media department. Um, I've been buying audio podcasts since before then, and it's just amazing to see everything evolve and be here with all of you discussing. Hi, I'm Eliza Davis, and I lead the offline team at Babbel um, on the performance marketing team. Um, 
at pretty much every brand that I've worked at, um, audio has always played a huge, huge impact on the success and just overall brand awareness. And um, we see the exact same thing at, at Babbel. So um, definitely excited to, to dive into some of what we do. I think you might have answered my first question, but anyway. No, it was <laughs> – so starting – well, thank you for the introduction. So as a macro question, as a starter, really, um, and I want to kind of pose this to – because we've got different brands, um, different verticals in the room, business to business, business to consumer. I want to pose this question to, to May and Eliza with two very different kinds of sort of verticals that you work in. What is it you believe that makes audio different from other channels for your business specifically? Um, and perhaps, May, you can talk to that for B2B first. When I was thinking through this, as she was asking, um, the first thing that comes up to my mind is visibility. Um, I think I, my background is in paid digital marketing. And in digital marketing, a lot of people on, in here probably know you can filter, you can target. Audio is very different. And so when we first ran audio ads, it was extremely exciting and refreshing that I had different people from the company, from our customers saying, hey, I heard your ad. And in the world of digital, it never really was like that because you, you're like, you're targeting a very specific audience versus audio is completely different. And I, I still have salespeople coming to me and saying, it's so great to hear um, us being on a pod that I listen to, that I know my customers listen to. Great. How about you, Eliza, from this perspective? Honestly, pretty much the same, the same thing. Um, I would say everything that everyone has touched on today in terms of the trust and loyalty between hosts, endorsers, and their audiences, um, <clears throat> the intimacy that exists between those two. Paul touched on it um, this morning, but just the fact that especially if you're listening with your headphones and if you're listening at home, one, like you can consume this media literally anywhere you are. Mm -hmm. Um, It can be with you at all times. Um, And in addition to that, it's basically just, it feels like it's a friend Um, and it's essentially word of mouth um, advertising. And so I think it's, it's super impactful um, when it, when it is genuine and it's the same thing we, we have, people coming up to us all the time. Uh, we, we heard this on the radio. We heard about you on our favorite podcast. And what's really cool is when you have people who listen to totally different genres tell you, oh, I, I heard about uh, my favorite host from this podcast was telling me about how Babbel helped them before they went to Italy to visit their future in-laws. Um, and, and then you hear someone else, oh, I needed to learn Spanish for a new job that I want. And I heard, you know, I heard about that from something totally different. And I think that's one of the great things is because we don't necessarily use that degree of targeting. You have like this huge breadth of opportunity. Cool. I want to pick up on something that may, you said at the, at the beginning where you said you came through digital channels. Right. And I'd like to actually pose to the audience, how many of you have started, obviously you're now dealing with audio, but how many of you actually started your media careers or marketing careers coming primarily through digital to show our hands? It's quite a fair few number of you. And the reason I asked that question, and I want to pose this to the entire panel is, as we've seen over the past few years, and again, we've talked about it a lot today, um, almost the, the resurgence, the revolution in audio the last few years. Based on this, um, and we see it in many other platforms, obviously, specifically in TV, there's lots of expertise on a client side, but how important do, you, do, do the four of you feel on this panel that it is for a brand to perhaps consider a dedicated degree for a person in, in just, just being responsible for audio, the fabled chief audio officer, Monica, that we've come up with? And is this something you would consider, or do you think there'd be serious pushback internally? I'm going to pose it to Kezia first. What do you think? 
Yeah, I mean, I can't imagine pushback. I think it all depends on how audio fits into your portfolio. So I can assume that if you've never had audio before, you probably have somebody maybe sped broadly testing channels. Um, sometimes we have sort of little incubator teams and companies. And so I think when you're at a place where audio is definitely working, you're going to want to diversify and further invest. And the reality is that if somebody spreads super thin, then they can't really be an expert. And so I think there's just so much going on in audio. I question if one person can really do it. I mean, we're talking about trust or we're talking talking about uh, mm-hmm. satellite, podcast, streaming audio. And so I think if it's working for you, unlikely that one person can do it. Um, and so I would say that you always want to lean in, lean into anything that's working. And if it's not working, figure out how to make it work. Um, I'm a firm believer that if your audience is there, you should be there. If they are engaged in a platform, if they're open to marketing, if they're open to being responsive, you should be there. And so I think sometimes when I hear people say, I do these eight different things, well, let's be honest, you're probably not doing them all well, right? And so I think, and then I ask again, well, how are your audio campaigns going? Oh, it's okay. We're struggling. You need to really have somebody who's going to lean in, really learn, immerse themselves in the space, figure out what works. And so I would be a fan of this if there is enough scale, enough going on. It's interesting you talk about scale. I mean, there's some recent reports that show that audio represents approximately, depending on the channel, but total audio, 8 to 9% of all spending. And yet there's also been independent studies say that it, audio consumes almost 25 to 30 percent of a person's individual media consumption um does that pay way internally to have that as an argument and should you just be in point an agency <laughs> i mean i use agencies <laughs> um because i think it's really hard to find people who are really great in this space and so even if you've got a really great marketer who can test their way into any channel i think the reality is at some point is you want to do more than the human bodies you have and i think we all want people to grow in their careers you want to feel like you've got enough time to do what you need to do and so i think every company i've been at when you get when you prove the concept i think it's always a great opportunity to hand it off to trusted hands and so um, I have been a fan of using agencies, but that's because they're bringing expertise as well as a lot of extra hands and bandwidth. And so I think you can, inf- you can try to do this in-house, but I have just found that at certain scales, it's really difficult to make the numbers work internally. Um, and I think also sometimes, you know, younger people, they want to diversify, right? And so sometimes, like, they want, after a few years, go to a different channel. And so I think if you've got an agency who can help you, then I think it's a little bit better for the long run. And so that's my thoughts. I'm going to pass that to anyone else on the panel. May or Eliza, do you have a perspective at all? I would agree. Um, I I would approach it as a a hybrid approach. Mm -hmm. Um, You start off. I mean, we started off, like, I think it was like 35% of my time and 50% of Eric's time. We hired an agency. We hired some contractors, and it was a hodgepodge. And then we proved that it it worked through data. And then, um, you know... We're, I wouldn't say that we've grown the team because we, we've more like pushed our agency to grow their team um, to help yeah. support us. <laughs> <laughs> so th- I, I think um, every company l- uh, has to kind of think about it from a standpoint of what works for them. And that's how it, we made it work for us. Cool. Eliza, did you want to add anything? I know you're a re- recent part of the Oxford family and working with you. Is there anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I think um, it's important to definitely look at, I would say, all of audio, but especially the piece that is similar to, you know, influencer, um, so working with endorsers and um, and all of that. It's important to have that expertise, um, and that can, in certain cases, mean that that is your sole you know, responsibility, but I think a lot of it depends on the resources of the company. Um, you know, if you're working at a smaller early stage startup where you're wearing a lot of hats, um, I think, you know, I think it just depends on the circumstance. I think in an ideal world, that role would exist. Um, and there would be a lot of growth opportunities for that person to work their way up and have, you know, audio as this, like career path fully on the brand side. Um, but I do think that just the way I'm thinking about it based off my experience is that typically you're, you're doing a lot of jobs. Um, so across different channels. Yeah. Um, so that's my take on it. I think in an ideal world, that would be awesome. Yeah. I'll do it. Okay. Well, so going into the next question then, um, and obviously we know 
depending on how you're using and the task is always task driven. Um, it can be a combination of both these things. But um, for each of you on the panel, um, or I'm going to pose this question out to both, uh, to May and Kezia actually, when considering audio as a potential channel, and you don't consider it, you actually, I know you both use it, but do you see it viewed uh, within your own sort of marketing mix as, uh, as a performance driving channel, a brand building channel, or is it a combination of both contingent on the kind of messaging or the tasks that you want to achieve? Can you talk to that, both of you? I can start. Um, I think for us, it's definitely both. Um, we have a pretty large marketing organization, and so the brand team as well as the performance team both use audio. But just like any company, the goals are very different. So if you're on a brand team, you probably value awareness, consideration, reach, maybe even driving cons- people to the site. I think if you're part of a performance team, there's a clear growth, there's some sort of clear conversion metric. And so even though we both operate in this space, um, our media plans are very different. So the shows we pick, the frequency, and so what we're looking to get out of it, the creative is very different. And so I would say if anybody's saying, oh, this type of channel is only X, Y, Z, I don't think it's true. And I don't think it's unique just where I'm at right now. I think many companies have been at, we've seen either if I'm responsible for brand, we do brand. If it's performance, or we call this kind of brand formers, it's kind of hybrid, where maybe you're launching a product, launching a new service, and you need to just talk to people a little bit to let them know, hey, there's what you need this service. And so I've found that audio gives you that opportunity to really talk about why, it, why what you do really matters. And so I would say for us, it is definitely both. Um, and not every channel works that way. And so I think... Um, yeah, audio. And I, when I say audio, I mean like all formats of audio. And so sometimes folks think like, oh, this format of audio works and it doesn't work. My customers are consuming all types of audio. There just isn't a type of audio that doesn't work for us. Like it all works for us. Fair enough. Some types of audio took us longer to figure out, to unlock. But in order for us to be at the scale we're at, we had to get that to work because the reality is our customers were there. They were responsive. And so it, we needed to be there. And so that's what I would say. Just before I pass it to May, that's an interesting point because when we relay back to the creative panel before or one of the earlier panels today, I think it was uh, – I think it could have been uh, a client from Hello Bella who was talking about um, the fact that when you go in and test, you, if, you, if you don't see your results immediately, you, can, you need to sort of persist through and see how you can work. Is that something that you would, you would, you would say is, is fair in this perspective as well? Just yeah, I think my perspective is not that something doesn't work, but rather how can I get it to work? And so because my mindset is always if my customers are there, if they're responsive to advertising, if I can target them and it's efficient to reach them, I should be successful, and so it's just a question of time. And so I've seen people give up too quickly, and I've always been fairly patient. Um, I'm always clear on what we're testing and the levers, but I think it's important to not give up. There have been some things, just look back at my career, where I was targeting college students. They were clearly on meta. We could not get that campaign to work. We still spent, we still tested because they were there. And so when I hear folks say, oh, I tried it once and it didn't work, well, you gave up too quickly, you know? And so I think every time you have a failed test, you should have clear learning. So from my perspective, it's never really a failed test. It's so fair enough, it didn't hit your conversion metric or whatever you were looking to accomplish. But if you learned something about your audience, if you learned what didn't work, that to me is a win. And so I would just say, keep that mindset, just be persistent in your, in your testing and try different things, but don't give up. 100%. If you know your customer is there and if they're responsive. 100%. May, if I can pose the question to you, obviously a very, very different vertical, different point of entry in terms of price, but would you, what would you say about that question? We're definitely uh, very different. Um, I would say that the short answer is both, but we force rank it. So performance by far is always going to be first, and then it's a brand play. Um, we look at the data and say, okay, is the performance there? And if it's not there, we look at it from a different perspective and say, okay, did we see a brand lift? Did we see any other data points that could point to um, us telling us that it was working or not? Mm -hmm. But we do force rank performance first. That's that's how we get the dollars to spend more money. (laughs) Cool. I want to shift gears slightly. We talked a little bit strategically about about the channel, performance, brand, etc. I'm going to um, take it in a little bit more of a tactical direction. Um, obviously, we're now in the second half of the year, we'll f- sort of rolling towards the, the the challenging times in Q3 and Q4. So, 
I'd like to ask this question. I'm going to pose this to uh, Kezia and Miranda, actually. So obviously we know the value of laying in early dollars, right? Obviously you get what you want early on. In this marketplace at the moment that's challenged, I mean, Dan alluded to it earlier, we're really moving into a buyer's marketplace. How do you see, um, and even if you want to quote some percentages, holding back last for, you know, dollars for last-minute opportunities as a tactic, especially as we go into the competitive second half of the year? I think it really depends. I mean, if what you're spending in audio is a material portion of what the business needs and you're on the hook for driving some kind of revenue, some kind of value, I would caution on holding dollars back. If you believe if you're successful, you can ask for more. And so I think I don't try to hold back a ton of money. Um, now, if you're in a place where you're part of the mix, it's not a material portion, and you've got a lot of space to test – podcasts are always opening up. And so I think it's always a good idea to have some money in case something new comes up, you can move quickly. Speaking as someone who's missed opportunities countless times, <laughs> and mainly because our internal process to get money is so slow. And so early on, Oxford said, please put aside money. Please put aside money. And so I would encourage you, if you, if you know exactly what you want to buy, go ahead and just buy it. But if you're not entirely sure what you want, just like when you go to the mall, just have some money <laughs> available that you can really take advantage and take action really, really quickly. And so I would say I'm a plan at heart. And so I'm not going to tell you hold money aside and just wait. Please, if you know what you want, go buy it, go reserve it. If you don't know what you want, hold some money back. But it's a tight marketplace. And so I think you also have to think about what you're buying. If your audience is in high demand, you got to move quickly. Um, if you know the kind of content you want to buy has low supply, move quickly. Um, if you're operating at a scale which is quite large and you need to get enough inventory, go ahead and buy it now. But I think if you're operating at a smaller scale, less money, you're going after an audience where you know their supply, you're very broad about your shows, then you can afford to wait. But I think only you know like how that works for you and your company. Um, I would also say it's not a one-size-fits-all. If you are in a competitive category or you know that your core shows sell out far in advance, obviously you need to lock those in as soon as possible. Um, but we do recommend reserving anywhere from 10 to 20% of budget for dynamic planning regardless of the marketplace. Um, throughout the years, we've always, ha always have seen opportunities, um, new shows, um, deals become available throughout the course of the year. Um, this year has been so overwhelming that we created a new process just to manage everything that's coming in on a daily basis. Um, and one thing that we do for our advertisers is we essentially have a rolling list of opportunities. So we know what we want, and if it becomes available at a reduced rate, we can quickly pull the trigger. Cool. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to further probe you on that a little bit, Miranda. So um, there's been a lot of change in the last three years, obviously through COVID. Have you seen any of these buying practices evolve in a post-COVID economy? And um, what do you think are the key trends that we're seeing in this direction? Um, last year was very different uh, from what we're experiencing this year. Um, as we've been discussing um, throughout the pandemic, podcasting became more mainstream. There were a lot of acquisitions and investments. And while those investments made the space more digitally enabled, um, publishers really set themselves up to take on more opportunities at the expense of existing advertisers. There was this hyper-focus on monetization, squeezing out costs. So advertisers were paying more, and we were getting less value. Um, even with contracts in place, we saw publishers trying to change terms, insertion types. They were cramming in a bunch of ad units to make room for programmatic, um, all with limited communication um, in pursuit of increased revenue. Um, that lack of transparency and accountability exacerbated an already, um, I don't want to say immature, a growing market where to this day we still see limited automation and standardization, um, even the most basic things like terminology. Um, this year, things have come down to earth. We've reset. We're recalibrating. It's a buyer's market um, with advertiser budgets um, scaling back or even staying flat, but new opportunities continuing to launch and existing opportunities fighting to fill inventory. Publishers are, publishers are working harder than ever for our dollars. And that competition, it 
gives us leverage with rates and terms, but it also gives us leverage in forcing accountability, um, particularly when it comes to things like reporting, delivery, separation, and exclusivity, which this year we have to be extra vigilant on because of the groundwork that has been laid over the last two years. But the good news is um, there's just a lot more flexibility and collaboration. Well, I know, I know um, we're running out a little bit of time, so I'm going to actually go to, to the last question. Um, and what I'm going to say is, from the four of you, what advice would you, would you give for new brands who are entering to the space, who are looking to go beyond just a testing scale perspective within the channel? Is there anything you can, you can impart to our colleagues here in the room? We're just beginning to test and learn within to the space. Eliza? I can start. Um, so the most common mistake that I see, particularly for advertisers managing things in-house, is that 50% or more of their media will just be with one or a few publishers, which I get, it's easy, the space is still very fragmented, but don't over-rely on one or just a few publishers. Um, I also see lack of diversification when it comes to genres or sub-genres. Even for advertisers spending hundreds of thousands of dollars a month in media, 50 to 75% of their budget will just be on two genres. Um, so diversify, test wide, make sure that you're creating a balanced campaign. Um, I would also say when something isn't a hit out of the gate, and Kizia, this goes back to your point, don't use, a cancellation is, is not an optimization. There are so many levers that you can pull, starting with allowable rate, spot lengths, placement in, in pods, <coughs> and testing out those different Buying tactics will give you the advantage of learning and building out best practices as you scale. And as I said before, now more than ever, publishers are willing to work with us. We just had a campaign, an underperforming campaign on a big show. We were running an announcer red spot. It wasn't working, and for no increase in CPM, they kept it flat. They converted it to a host red. Um, I would also say... Um, just because a podcast is cool, hosted by a celebrity or at the top of the charts, does not mean that you should buy it. In fact, for those reasons, um, the host sometimes doesn't really care as much, and that shows up in performance. Um, and then I think it's a lot more complex and nuanced. Um, there are a lot of layers to it than I think most people think. Um, so I would just encourage, like, have patience. Um, don't take shortcuts and don't let publishers cut your value short. Push them to problem solve on issues, especially the many issues that are coming to light, um, until the ad tech is sophisticated enough to manage things like um, even rotation in pod. Um, there are a lot of places to buy. There are a lot of ways to buy. This year alone, we've worked with over 200 different partners, many of them operating on their own terms. And it's always changing, which makes it really hard to standardize best practice. I'll give an example. There's a medium, medium-sized publisher. A year and a half ago, they're trying to sell me on, oh, we call our dynamically inserted spots baked in because they live forever. A couple months ago, having a casual conversation, I'm asking about programmatic, and they're bragging that they have all of this inventory because they're starting to strip out those baked-in reads that you guys bought as baked-in that lives there forever. So that's just one example of the many hidden subtleties that you need to be aware of. And the Pixel, it's not a magic bullet. It's not going to solve all of your problems, um, but it will help you get, get clarity and visibility into those types of things, which are crucial um, if you want to scale in this space. Well, pearls. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else from the from the, from the motor? I, I don't have okay. more. I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, I could go on, but you said we were short on time, and you already cut a question no, 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 out. No, no, so. no, that's good. It's good. It's golden. Kezia or May or Eliza, is there anything else you, you, you feel you yeah, can add to Yeah, I would to just that? add um, a few things. I think I know this is something that Dan and Miranda are both really passionate about, probably everyone in this room, but um, something that has come to light as the industry is changing and something that we definitely pay a lot more attention to now is our share of voice. Um, you know, with all of these changes with DAI, with faked in spots, um, what's happening is that it's sounding a little bit more like radio. Um, and you have these commercial, commercial breaks. That's, that's genuinely what they feel like now. And they're disruptive. Mm -hmm. And you could be one of 
three. Um, and that's something that it used to just be, oh, pre-roll or mid-roll. Now it's where you fall within all of the advertisers that are going to be in that episode. Um, and so that is something that I think is really important to pay attention to. And then in addition to that, something that I've learned, especially with podcasts, is we all talk about the, you know, the marketing funnels, upper funnel, middle funnel, um, and lower funnel. But I actually like apply that exact same thinking when it comes to podcasts. So you have these larger shows, you have the medium sized shows and you have the smaller shows. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the channel holistically, you can then, you know, you then have an efficient channel. What that does is when you have these smaller shows and you're, you're also thinking about frequency on all of these shows. So on the smaller shows where the audience size is, you know, it's not growing as fast, maybe you'll be, you'll have less frequency, but you'll see such impact on these affordable shows. You'll get insane ROI, ROAS whatever it is that you, you need. <laughs> um, and it then gives you the ability to be on, you know, these more brandy, um, higher funnel sh- shows that make it so that you have this entire like journey basically. Yeah. And you have this opportunity for multiple touch points all within one channel. And I think that that's something that's super unique about podcasts and audio. Um, you know, whether that's buying national radio or local, radio, you know, whatever it is, you can always find holes and you can fill them. Um, and so that would be, you know, I think probably my, my two cents, my advice in addition to all of the wonderful things that Miranda just said. Anything keys you have, man? I, I, I would add, um, I would say patience and set your tracking and setting up goals. Um, yeah, that's where I would, would say, because in the very beginning, it takes time to ramp up. It takes time to get everything ready. I mean, it took us forever to come up with an ad. Mm-hmm. Um, it's all brand new. And so patience is really important. Um, which performance marketers always have, right? <laughs> of course. I'm very <laughs> patient. Um, and then the data piece is really important, at least in our business. Yeah. We are in a B2B business. Our sales cycle is extremely long. There isn't an instant gratification where I'm like, we just sold X how many thousands or millions of product. Um, it takes 6 to 12 to maybe 2 to 3 years, Within depending on... Um, the size of the deal. And so, um, like measurement where we look at, okay, how long has it been? Where is this lead at this point in time? That's really important to us. So in the very beginning, we have to set tracking and measurement in the very beginning so that we can compare it against the rest of the, um, our, our paid media mix, right? Because at the end of the day, you're you're pretty much fighting for someone else's dollar, sure. right? Someone sure, sure, mentioned sure. about you know taking some of your meta dollars and putting into audio. Well, you you have to show that it's going to do better than meta. A better use or a better deployment of the dollars, exactly. More efficiency, sure. right? Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, I think I'll just end with if you know that audio is important to your audience, and so the question is, how do you know it's important? So if they are spending many hours, if it's part of their routine, so whether they're turning on the radio or playing something, it's part of their life, it should be part of your life. It should be part of your mix. And so it's just so powerful because they're open to the advertisement. They almost expect it. And so I don't know how many channels or people expect and embrace uh, advertising. And so I just encourage you all to just find ways of making it work. The goal should be a nice mixture of audio channels, not being doubled down in one particular area. And just like I said, just be patient. Our goal has always been like goal standard is always incrementality. So some of the panels talked about that. Like we have to show incremental lift for everything that we do. If we can't get there the first time, then understanding that the creative work, that the mix of shows work, um, that the weight work, the seasonality, our business has seasonality like many of yours does. Maybe it's because we just ran the ads at the wrong time. And so again, just be clear how you're defining success. And it should be a mixture of learning objectives as well as conversion or brand or company objectives. And as long as you're checking some of those boxes every single time, that's a win. And so if this is your first time launching, use some of that with your internal stakeholders so that 
Worst case scenario, if you don't get that incremental report at the end, you can still say, look at all the things that we learned. This is still a win. If you anchor too heavily on one metric and you miss that one metric, sometimes, depending on the companies you're at, it's going to be pretty hard to get the ability to run a test again. And so I think you've just got to precede some of that well before the campaign starts so that you have that long runway of testing and learning and patience. Good luck. <laughs> thank you. I, thank you. I want to... I want to thank the panel, May, Kesey, and Miranda, Eliza, for the, for the pearls of wisdom on this. Thank you all for joining the Media Roundtable. And a special thanks to Kezia, May, Eliza, and the brands that they represent for being willing to share their thoughts with you here in this forum. This podcast is brought to you by Oxford Road, where we want you to succeed in audio and to use it as an influence for good. As members of the marketing community, we have the power to advance voices that don't just entertain but edify, to build bridges instead of burning them, and to rise above our differences and show that collaboration is possible when we treat each other with respect. And if you're a marketer looking to align with our vision, reach out to our agency, Oxford Road, by visiting OxfordRoad.com and subscribing to our weekly newsletter, The Influencer. Special thanks to Bianca, Kyle, Haley, Jennifer, Neil, Spencer, Stu, and James Cridlin, and the team at Podcast One. And as always, influence responsibly.